This episode has been brought to you by our super generous supporters on Patreon. Supercomputers are a staple of science fiction. You've probably seen them flying interstellar spaceships or creating virtual worlds for our own amusement or enslaving all humanity while harvesting them as their own batteries, which is always fun. But what do supercomputers actually do? And how do they match up to the human brain? Good Stuff producers Matt Weber and Sam Grant take us on a journey to Argonne National Laboratory to find out what we can do with supercomputers. <laughs> What I've always found fascinating about sort of the Hollywood representation of supercomputing is that one, yeah, they have, there's always sort of this artificial intelligence component, right, you know, that sort of came up really with science fiction or with that they're always incredibly smart, right, or somehow, you know, there's sort of this, this emerging intelligence associated with them. But, but supercomputers don't work that way fundamentally, right? This is Catherine Riley, Director of Science of the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, and she's going to introduce us to Mira. All right, so buried in the back is Mira. <laughs> Mira is a supercomputer. But this is one of three rows of Mira, and we can walk back and through all of them. There's 48 total refrigerators, as I, as I like to think of them. And Argonne houses two supercomputers currently, Mira and Theta, with a third and more powerful one, Aurora, on the way. At Argonne, there are no artificial intelligences and no robot armies in the works and no computer overlords scheming to turn us into living batteries. Instead, their supercomputers are doing something much more important, science. So a supercomputer really fundamentally is, is a scientific tool, right? It's a tool we use for science and engineering to answer questions that we would not be able to answer otherwise. Not like it would take us a long time to be able to answer that question, but we probably wouldn't be able to answer it because it would cost too much money or it would take too much time. This is achieved by running a bunch of really, really high-powered processors in parallel. Think of thousands of laptops all working on the same problem. At peak performance, Mira operates at 10 petaflops and Theta operates at 9.6 five petaflops. That means they're both capable of doing over nine quadrillion floating point operations per second. The next generation of supercomputer, Aurora, should be able to operate at an order of magnitude above Theta and Mira. But why do we need all these petaflops? So we use supercomputing to do experiments. They're theoretical experiments, but they're experiments. And, and we try to use supercomputing to not only do those experiments, but get to the answers of those questions even faster. That is the fundamental role of what a supercomputer is. And so we use it, for example, to do things like blowing up a star, right? We can't blow up a star in a lab, so you have to use a supercomputer to blow up a star because, you know, I don't think we'd want the ramifications otherwise. Yeah, so supercomputers tackle all kinds of problems that aren't easily replicated in a lab, like blowing up a star. But you can also run virtual tests on engine lubricant or simulate molecules and drug interactions. Basically, any problem that requires huge amounts of data to process, we use supercomputers for. We have, as a, as a larger community, huge databases, huge data of all kinds of different protein structures and all kinds of different drugs and all the ways that they, they interact with different things. But making sense out of that is really hard for our brains, right? Just to look at millions and millions of data entries and try to come up with the right pairs can be, or right patterns and the right collections can be hard. It's really easy for a supercomputer to do. Yeah, so if you can use a supercomputer to sift through all that data, you can reduce the number of possible candidates and reduce the amount of lab time needed to find the right drug, thus speeding up research and scientific discovery. Instead of having to try a thousand drugs in a trial, maybe these are the three that are the best ones to try. So it goes, it brings that space down really small. Another really good example we use on the time and money is car design. Our cars today are, are incredibly more safe than they were 30 years ago. They're incredibly better designed. And the transition, one of the key parts of that transition, was that car manufacturers started doing simulations for understanding things like crumple zones and safety characteristics. If you had to do a full experiment, build the car, and crash it to see how it would behave, I mean, that's a million dollars a shot. But instead, can you do that in an hour on a computer and get a, an answer you believe? Suddenly, you can make much more progress. Instead of having to spend months building, running the experiment, and then hitting reset, you're getting an answer in, in a day that might have taken you a year. As supercomputers give us more answers faster, we can ask more questions. This accelerates innovation. It's, it's kind of astounding. It's a really exciting when there's a question that you've been trying to ask for a long time and that suddenly you have the capability to answer it and, and actually kind of fast. That's breathtaking. So the, what excites me the most is you have, you have a question and maybe you were doing part of that question because part of that question would take you six months to answer. And so you're still doing it because you want to answer the big question, right? So it's six months. But you switch, right? And you switch and you, you, in, you 
you explore supercomputing and you realize that, well, instead of six months, I'm getting my answer now in half an hour. Half an hour. Well, you can, answer, you can ask very different questions when you start getting your answer in half an hour or in five minutes. Because there's more information in the answers. As scientists, there's no answer, right? There's no single answer. We come up with one answer and we've got about 30 other questions that spawn out. But with this accelerated innovation comes a need for accelerated processing power. The next step beyond Aurora will be computers that can operate on the order of an exaflop. An exaflop is a thousand times more powerful than a petaflop. To match what a one exaflop computer system can do in just one second, you'd have to perform one calculation every second for more than 31 billion years. For reference, the universe is only about 13 billion years old. The exaflop is also an important landmark and supercomputing because this is purported to be the computational power of the human brain. An exaflop capable machine would theoretically be just as powerful as our brain. But it will take some pretty powerful brains to build these supercomputers in the first place. We have to be more innovative to build these computers so that they can advance our science because we're running into problems with physics. Like they're just, it's just harder, right? We're, we're getting down to parts on these chips which are like the size of an atom, right? right. At that point, physics really starts taking over. So you have to be more innovative, we're having to be more clever. And so on the Aurora time frame, we're looking at these pre scale systems that change how we move data, like how we will manage data, how data flows within the system. And that's a big deal. Like how you move a huge data set, like what the cosmos looks like, right? And all of that data is actually a substantial amount of data or, or the state of a fluid flow, like blood flow through a cardiovascular system. You have to save that and move that, have it be in the right place to do a calculation. That data hierarchy is changing, like where the data needs to be when, and that's one of the biggest challenges as we go forward. But even with all these advances, we still can't touch the human brain. While some next generation supercomputers might be able to approach the computational power of our brains, they'll never be able to replicate it. In fact, we wouldn't want a supercomputer that mimics the brain at all. Our brains are messy, they're analog, the hardware and software in the human brain is all mixed up. That's not to say our brains aren't really good at what they do. They're spectacular at making new connections, rewiring themselves, and being infinitely flexible. But running mathematical equations and processing massive amounts of aggregated data just aren't our forte. That's what we need supercomputers for. We need them to be efficient, predictable, logical machines. In other words, we need them to be everything our brains aren't. So artificial intelligence and sentient supercomputers in movies and TV may make for good science fiction. They are bad for actual scientific discovery. So what do you think? Will supercomputers ever compete with the human brain? Do we even want them to do that? Let us know what you think in the comments. Special thanks to Argonne National Laboratory for letting us poke around with their one-of-a-kind million-dollar scientific equipment. And if you liked this video, please consider clicking that thumbs up button and subscribing. And a special thanks to our Patreon subscribers. Without you, we would not be able to do the good stuff. Period. So if you'd like the show to last long enough to execute an exaflop of calculations, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching.